Exactly now. I don't know. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Jen with Two Rivers Books and Weird Sisters Yarn. I'm here with Zipporah Newton Calvert from Reading is Resistance Ooh. and Matt Ross, who is a local Portland, has been a local Portland educator. It sounds like he's recently had a career transition. Um, a quick rundown of what we're doing in the shop this month. We've got a few exciting things on the table. The Dye Project is going to be partnering with us for a trunk show. They are a dye company that started here in Portland. They've moved to Santa Cruz, but they're gonna come back to do a special trunk show with us on Saturday, August 22nd. On August 23rd, we are pulling together a bunch of local food justice um, advocates to have a conversation about what food equity means and what's happening in Portland right now, what policy is impacting that and where we can go from here. That's gonna be on the 23rd of August, Sunday. And we have a reading going on with um, Christopher Beha, um, author of The Index of Self-Destructive Acts, and Rob Nair, a sports writer who published recently um, Powerball, the anatomy of a modern baseball game. That's going to be on Thursday, August 27th. Uh, more details are available on our website. Um, but yeah, I'm going to turn this over. We're talking about anti-bias teaching. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jen. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Jen. Nice to meet you, too. Yeah. Hi, everybody. So, um, yeah, I'm Zipporah Newton Calvert from Reading is Resistance. And our mission, if you don't already know, is to support parents and teachers in cultivating anti bias and anti racist libraries and reading experiences for young people that seed conversations and action toward racial justice in the community. And I'm here with Matt. I am so excited. When I asked Matt to come on, I was like, should I ask? And then he said yes. And I was like, Yes, so I'm really excited. <laughs> I'm really excited to be here with Matt. Um, I'll, I'm going to let Matt introduce himself, but I first wanted to say that Matt and I have known each other for um, uh, many years. Like we were like 2006. Babies. I was thinking about it. Yes, like 2006, I think. Somewhere mm -hmm. in there, it's like 14 plus years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Time. We met in when we were younger and had <laughs> fewer experiences with the work that we do in education. Yeah. And we still are connected, which I think is so cool. Um, and my class, Social Justice and K-12 Education, has done some work when Matt was the principal over at Open School. And um, I just, we're really lucky to be able to talk to you. I'm so glad. Do you want to say anything about who you are? <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I, uh, man, so many different hats, uh, mm -hmm. just life, you know, just education piece, been doing that for 12 plus years, closer to 15, um, and um, a proud husband, um, and um, excited about that, and having a really good time growing and learning there, um, a dad of two two boys uh, until they tell me different and mm -hmm. they are uh, thriving, having a great time. And I, I love being a father. It makes me cry more than I thought I would cry as a, uh, as a 40 plus year old man. And uh, really um, embracing that. I just love being a dad, love being a husband and uh, love being an educator. And I get to uh, stay home this year, uh, maybe the next two years with my boys to um, teach them and to help them grow and to be um, just happy people, you know, and, and well-balanced people. So um, here I am, here I am. Can I just say, uh, while I'm thinking about it, that the reading this resistance is just a breath of fresh air. Mm -hmm. And as someone like, oh, the layers and layers and layers, like. As someone who's going to be home, um, the, just last night I got an email um, uh, with a lesson plan that was like laid out very nice. It's actually right here. All of the colors we are. Um, I've already printed it out and everything. I'm like, yep, using that. I'm definitely using that. Like it's like K, I think K 
whatever it's mm -hmm. uh, k plus and so yeah. like it's uh, flexible and uh, i just want to say thank you to the work that you all are doing around that it, it, it's it's very substantive and like meaningful work that you're doing in the layout and everything and the lesson plans all that stuff is just like dynamite and life-saving and makes this doable <laughs> it really really does i just wanted to say one other thing too thinking about you like when, when i met you we were both at psu in different roles but mm -hmm. one of the things i was exploring was how um what resistance looks like in different ways. I was actually doing some of my own study exterior to my coursework. And I found, um, which I was finding, uh, finding my way in like, how do I um, s swim through the sea of whiteness in a lot of ways. And one of the ways of doing that is finding ways to have documentation, um, have proof as it were, I knew of various ways that black kids in particular resist in uh, systems of education, but didn't have it documented. So I didn't have to necessarily have language to describe it. But I found, um, and I'm thinking of reading being resistance, I found where there were two things that I found in researching it is that black kids often um, resisted either by not doing their work in school. It was, it was a form of resistance of like, this system is oppressing me and I'm going to shut down. I'm not going to do my work in the school. It's one of the ways that is well documented, one of the ways that Black kids uh, resist and still do. And then the, another way that kids resist, again, well documented is by excelling. Mm. Um, uh, excelling i'm gonna be the best student you say that i can't do this i'm not capable of doing this you don't believe me i'm gonna prove you wrong and i excel and uh, a part of my journey as an educator has been like how do i create uh relationships in a context to where students feel like um i feel comfortable enough and i want to be able to just excel and not feel like i have to resist necessarily mm. and so um I'm just thankful for the work that you're doing because it, it it reminds me of that work that I did uh, mm -hmm. years ago when I think about reading being resistance. I'm like, oh, those are the students who are like, I'm going to prove you wrong. I'm going to show a different way of doing this. Um, I'm going to gather so much information to be able to break down walls, stereotypes, mm -hmm. so on and so forth uh, to change the, change the game. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate what you said about like the different modes of resistance. I've been talking a lot with my mm. students this term about that. And, you know, we're all finding our way right now in mm. what it looks like. And it looks like a lot of different things. Um, and I appreciate that, you know, sometimes it looks like I'm not participating in this system mm -hmm. at all. And for educators to really mm. remember that, um, one of the things with the readings resistance questions that are from teaching tolerance and then the type of teaching that, you know, I hope that I can continue to learn how to do is um, not assuming that I understand the story that's happening. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so being able to have a wider lens and not not making assumptions based on mm -hmm. my identity and my experience, because it's going to be really different from other people's. Um, and my students are like finding ways to show up. I actually had last night, <laughs> I love this, I have two students who are like, well, we are going to be dentists. Um, yeah. and, and, and they were like, but maybe you can be revolutionary dentists. Oh, like, nice. Yes, nice. yes, you can. Nice. They're like, yeah. you don't know what that looks like. I was like, that's okay. You don't yeah. have to. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Stick together it, and figure it out. Interesting enough. So it, this is really interesting that you brought that up because like, okay, like what does that look like? What What's a context where that would seem to make sense? So. I've been to the dentist. I had an experience this past year at the dentist. I'm sitting in the dentist chair. I needed to get some work done. And the dentist is explaining to me uh, options, but left out an option, left the most expensive option out. Mm. And, and they're exp in explaining to me. And I happened to know there was another option. So I uh, 
I, and they're cleaning my teeth. The dentist is uh, explaining this to me. I had to tell them, pause, time out, wait. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's another option. How come you didn't give me the other option? Mm -hmm. You know, why, you know, and, and my experience, and I said this to them, I said, my experience has been as a black person, um, I will get the, the lesser expensive option um, proposed to me, and then I'll have to go on with that in my mouth. And I have to go on with that circumstance the rest of the way. Give me all the options, please. Don't marginalize me and, and, and feel like, oh, I'm not going to give you this option. So I, I'm, I say that just to say like to your students who are like, well, what could this look like? Uh -huh. Being aware enough that um, you would present all the options and not marginalize people based on what they look like, what you think their social status, is, so on and so forth. It happens. Mm -hmm. It happens all across the board. And um, I was furious, uh, mm -hmm. to be honest, because I just, I'm working too hard to be a good person and to change the world to, <laughs> it's working too hard to, I'm like, come on, man, you, we, you gotta, yeah. you gotta, you gotta do better. We just have to do better. We just have to do better. Yeah. That's all this yeah. too. And, yeah. and we gotta start calling people out. So he was upset yeah. and I was like, I'm fine with you being upset. Yeah. Treat me the way I should be treated. Yes. You're yeah. upset enough to do it different, buddy. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's an interesting thing because when I think of you and a lot of the work that you've done, I think of like love as a center piece um, because I think wherever you go, that's just like, I don't know. You seem to bring that with you or mm -hmm. are attracted to places that already have that. I don't know, but I think it's mutual. <laughs> um, but that also that doesn't exclude, like that doesn't mean if we come from a place of love, it doesn't mean that anger isn't there. It doesn't mean that you know, expression of disgust yeah. and fear yeah. and yeah. like do better and expectation, like holding people accountable isn't also there. That's part of love, right? Like, right. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, no, that is a, a big part of love. It's a huge part of it. And, and I, I feel like love, love me enough to hold me accountable, you know, and I'm gonna love you enough to hold you accountable. And I mm -hmm. think there's a way to do it. Um, there's a way to be, um, one of the things that some people have mistakenly, I think, um, thought that I was too nice, you know, going through the world. And I, I, I don't think so, but I think that, you know, love can show up and saying no. Sometimes love is no, and I'm loving you by saying no or holding someone accountable or calling someone to the car carpet. And I, I, the love shows up also in like, how you allow people to have the second chance mm -hmm. and, and get it right, you know? Yeah. And I'm not just done with you. I'm not giving up on people, but I can hold you accountable mm -hmm. um, and tell the truth, which is a good thing. I'm super yeah, happy. for sure. One of the things that I did to like liberate my own teaching, it just, you know, a chipping away at things where I'm like, why is this still in my teaching? Why is this still in my mm. practice? Like, psh, you know, what, what else should go there? So I stopped grading, yeah. which yeah. is of course, like, why was I doing that at all? And mm -hmm. so we're toward the end of the term and the students are like, so how am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> and this one kid's like, so I didn't get to this one assignment. And for all these reasons, they're real reasons, right, right. totally valid reasons. Yeah. Has been showing up in class. Like he's a participant in our community. He's like, but should I try to squeeze it in before the end of the term or should I, you know? <laughs> and I was like, well, you are gonna assess you. So, I was like, this is yeah. very liberating for me as well. Like, I don't yeah, have to right. decide for you what is enough that you put into this experience that you and what you need out of it and what you have the capacity to do right now. You get to measure that. And he was like, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's that's a completely different way of looking at it. And, mm -hmm. and, and we're, we as a society aren't accustomed to that. And so that's outside of the norm of like, you know, the checkbox idea of what education is, um, you know, the, the student having some autonomy in, you know, the grading and being a part of the grading process and self-assessment and reflection, you know, prioritized in, mm -hmm. the, in the idea of grading. It's just different. So it's like, whoa, that's revolutionary. I can't, most <laughs> students can't see that far. I don't know how to even think about it that way and have to think about it that way, which is great. That's, mm -hmm. that's great. It's been really interesting. It also allows the space for someone to say like, I'm not doing this assignment because it does not resonate. It does not fill me. Like it does yeah. not, 
And mm -hmm. that's important for me to know. And also for, you know, them to have the agency of being like, you know, this, you know, that shutdown yeah. piece is actually even like built in, like you can, you can say no. Yeah, to right. um, and then I also have the opportunity, not that it should be built on the back of students, but we're in a learning community together. And so I also have the opportunity to be like, well, why did that happen? And what does that mean mm -hmm. in our communal space? So yeah. it has been, it has been good. I have a couple of questions. I have an educator yeah. question that I really want to ask because yep. people keep asking me this and I'm thinking about it all the time lately. And then I have like a parenting question because we're going to no, like that. Oh, great, great question. I love that. <laughs> yep. um, so, and I wrote this to you because we're teachers, we like to plan, but it's, it's that question about, so a lot of, a lot of teachers, many teachers were already teaching real history and teaching about racism and teaching about identity. Many, many teachers were not. Yeah. Some folks have been activated um during this mm. current uprising and mm. are interested in doing more um something that i think about in my own teaching and i know that people have been asking me about and i don't have the answer maybe there there probably isn't because there's not <laughs> there's not answers to these things but it and this relates to to parenting too i think but how do we teach about what's real real oppression real harm mm. um real complexity of identity and experience that some of it we carry in our bodies and and some of it we just mm. learn about <clears throat> um while still not like causing more trauma especially in spaces mm. where they're multiracial where we have students with a lot of different experiences that all are really learning different things based on their identity and how this country has kind of put them in these different positionalities um and it's the same with my kiddos too because sometimes i'm like oh i think i maybe mm too much on the real things, <laughs> or yep. it back, yep. like, you know, trying to have a balance and making mm -hmm. sure celebrating the joy of, you know, our of mm -hmm. present. I would love to hear some of your thoughts about yeah. that mode and then maybe also in a parent mode. Yeah. So yeah, this is, this is a really complicated question, right? It's really, really hard. And, um, uh, something I learned some years back is if, if someone has, an answer and it's just like do this one thing and that you solved it you know that's the wrong answer <laughs> yeah. it's not true if it's yeah. it, it won't be yeah. summed up and like oh just do this one Agreed. thing it's, Agreed. It's, 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 it's more complex than that yeah there are too many variables that are at place but I, I would say something that has worked for me and that resonates really well with me there are a couple of things that i think help with that and i'm going to merge the two being a parent and and a teacher because I think uh, they're 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 really similar and really one and the same in a lot of ways. Um, and I have biracial children, so I'm having this conversation a bunch all the time too. The first thing that I would say um, is do your you have to be doing your own personal work. Yeah, you have to be have to be doing your own personal work. You can't teach what you don't know, and so. Um, if you're doing your own personal work, you will be able to have the conversations when it's time. You will be able to be flexible. You'll also be able to apologize when you mess up and be able to admit when you mess up. If you're not doing your personal work, you're gonna like, you know, sweep things under the rug. You're gonna lose uh, face with people. Um, and students, particularly students of color, are gonna be really turned off by you not just being able to own up to stuff. Mm -hmm. and uh and just be honest about it and so the first step is doing the personal work um but the second step i think is uh normalizing the conversations and so when things come out of left field or um uh or when they're lopsided and then when i say lopsided i'm saying when i say normalize the conversation i'm not saying normalize the super heavy conversations. I'm saying normalize just conversations about race. Mm -hmm. um, I have conversations with my son all the time about race. Many of them super light, mm -hmm. but I just highlight and point out, here's look, oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. the, the, here we saw these three shows and the people look the same in the three shows. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. We go on to the next thing. <laughs> but I just highlighted that it was super light. And so when dad comes to talk about race, 
in his mind, he's like, well, we have conversation about race all the time. Yeah. It's super, it doesn't take me to this place where I'm like, oh man, it's not, here comes dad talking about race again. I've normalized conversations about race. Many of them are really light. So when I go heavy, it's, it's not doomsday. Yeah. The, the other benefit of doing that in a, like a classroom setting is the variability of the students that you have. Yeah. And uh, many times in class, I know this from my own experience as a student and as an educator, many times uh, students of color uh, in classes are, they may either know the material already or they may um, just not be at a place where they, they just can't take any more right now, no right. more. Just, time out and when, what they need in those situations i found is they need really empowering stories of other folks of color they need to know about when we won not that we had slavery yeah no i don't want to hear about slavery one more time mm -hmm. tell me when we did something uh well mm -hmm. spin that story show me the uh black sec excellence for example you know um story tell me about some different experiences and so uh, you mentioned a few minutes ago having the flexibility of students being able to do an assignment or not. Yeah. So having that variability is really, really helpful. And then having multiple entry points for an assignment. Um, so uh, whereas white students who typically go around the conversation of race and, um, and racism have a lot more work than students of color do to do to, to get caught up or be at the same place. They mean they, it's just gonna will look different for them, and they'll end up looking different. Um, for example, so this summer um, I just finished up leading um, summer school, and Black Lives Matter was the theme of our summer school. Uh, instead of leaning into quote unquote the struggle, as it were, we leaned really into Black excellence. Mm. So we focused on the writing of Odd Lord. We focused on Marsha P. Johnson. We focused on uh, Henry Lacks in science. We, we were just highlighting black excellence over and over and over. And that's empowering. And it's like, okay, this is a part, this is why we have the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, because these stories are not told enough. We, we need to highlight this black excellence. And then folks who are tired are like, oh, I'm not so tired anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm back in the game again. And everyone needs to know all those, those stories, needs to know that information. So um, doing the personal work, normalize the conversations, uh, light ones too. So when you do go heavy, it's, it's similar to saying yes as much as you can. So when you have to say no, you can, get, <laughs> you can go no. It's like, all right, I don't say no. Yeah. <laughs> normalize those conversations about race. Um, and then the last one is to start really early. Yeah. Um, I noticed my son was processing race and colorism in particular at age three. Mm -hmm. He was already hip to it um, and uh, was having ar articulating what was easier, what was better uh, on the basis of color at age three and probably could have done it before that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. just some thoughts. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I mean, I have uh, a lot of parenting students too who will ask white white parents are generally the ones who are like, when do I talk about this? Because yeah. again, we're in a multiracial family. We've been talking about it since day one. And similarly, yeah. in like celebrate you know celebratory ways, in historical ways, uplifting you know like narratives that they might not hear in school, trying to get those in first before mm -hmm. they have to you know get to school. Yeah. Be like, mm, that's not who invented the light bulb. Like, you right, know? yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I, I often will have white parents who are like, I haven't talked about this yet, and their kid is, you know, seven, eight, and uh, like, are they ready? And I'm like, they're always ready. Like, they yeah. know, they right. already know. <laughs> yeah. so find out what yeah. they know. You know, have some, you know, mm -hmm. curiosity questions. Start reading some stuff. You're gonna find out where they are, and then just, you know, it's conversations about identity. Um, and I guess that's one of the reasons I like books too, is because it just gives us a place to start without, yeah. you know, like being out there alone. Like you've got, it was, and it's also just like what you were saying about your summer school. Like there's a legacy of folks forever back yep. <laughs> who yep. have built this work um, in mm. multiple identities who resisted oppression. Like who are those people? How can we, 
know that they're with us um, as mm -hmm. we move forward. We're not alone and tap into that historical knowledge. I was listening to the Brian Stevenson podcast that you sent me and <laughs> I want to like share that to the page because it's really good. But it was, you yes. know, one part that was really striking me in the beginning was about um, sort of like the history that we're taught, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the kind of stories that we're taught and we know that those aren't real stories, but then we've built and we everything's built upon those stories. And so to dismantle that in ourselves and, you know, and with our kids, that's something we can do mm -hmm. from the very beginning and start, they can carry different stories with them and they're going to operate on those. It's going to be a different experience in the world, which I think is really cool um, and important. Thank you for that advice. I, I agree. I agree. And I think that it's good advice because it's uh, also just can mean so many different things. Um, yeah normalizing that conversation you know something that in my class where i'm just like this class is about racial justice so here we go yeah, everybody. yeah. Right. Like, right. We're about a celebration too and we're going to find out talk about our identities and get really close you know building mm -hmm. relationships is such an important part of being able to also tell someone like you've crossed a line or you know to be able to be in conversation yeah. community with each other and still like hold each other accountable um mm -hmm. not happening and it's exciting to see that um, and I want that for my kids too. <laughs> well, I, you know, I was thinking, and it reminds me of like the opposite of normalizing the conversation. Too often, I still hear people say things like, "If we weren't talking about race, it just it would go away. The problem yeah. would go away." Yeah. And to me, it reminds me of like those of us who have either a spouse or a partner. If we had um, an argument or a disagreement or something happened. And we just didn't talk about it. That's the way we're gonna get past it. It's just not, just not. Okay. <laughs> build up and build up. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah. That is not how you get past uh, no. problems. Just ignore it and act like it didn't happen. Uh, no. But if what if we talked about race in ways so much and normalize those conversations as a society so much that we actually got on the same page about it. Mm -hmm so that it didn't have to be all super heavy every time there could be someone could cross the line make a mistake whatever and it could just we could be so in lockstep that a look is like oh yeah my bad I, this this happens but we're fine we're in relationship we're on the same page as a society we're so far apart from being on the same page because we are not having this conversation we need to normalize it and then yeah. it'll be okay. We get past the feelings of like, I'm feeling guilty and all that. The more we talk about it, we get past all that. We're in community, we're in relationship. We just gotta normalize it. We gotta yeah. normalize. Mm -hmm. And sometimes ask each other, we were talking yesterday in class about um, like even just pausing and saying like, what do you mean by that word? Like, are we even in the same, mm -hmm. are we even talking about the same thing when we use the same word? <laughs> like right. if I, yeah. The, I mean the same thing to you as it means to me. Let's like find out. Let's find yeah. out. What so to ask those yeah. questions and curiosity questions, and that's another thing that's that books are so good for. I imagine that you you said you were getting a lot of books, and I would yeah. love to end with some um, a little bit of book talk about what we read with our kiddos or yeah. any good books that you've been reading um, yourself or yeah. books. Are, I personally love kids' books the most. So yes. I, I only read those now. Ooh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> this book is so sweet. I don't have that one. To share. Um, I have been collecting. So part of my story is that I am white and also indigenous, but I don't know much about my Anishinaabe mm -hmm. self <laughs> because my great grandma was in a boarding school and was mm -hmm. had poor assimilation and then just like did not talk about it. So one of the ways that I'm trying to build that back with like very little to hold on to from that was passed on to me is um, collecting a lot of books that are from, yeah, from where I'm from. So, or part of me is from. So anyway, this is a sweet gratitude book. This is just a good example mm -hmm. of a book that's like, obviously like identity is a part of this book, like throughout the pictures, the art, and you can see that like, mm -hmm. this is like a First Nations <laughs> book. Yeah. And it's also just about sweetness and how to be in community and, I just love that. And I read this to my older kids too. Like I think picture books are just for everybody. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're some of my favorites. <laughs> yeah. Well, you get to have so many conversations with those. And um, it, it, it also allows the brain to 
dream a bit and to, um, you know, to have some, uh, well, how can imagination part of that? Like, you know, I, one of the questions I always ask my son when reading to him is like, what do you think is going to happen next? Before we turn the page, what's what's what do you think is about to happen? Um, but on the on the, I do have a couple books here. Um, I don't have a ton of kids books in mind, but I have a list of them that I would suggest to folks. This is one though that's just been like fire for me and my kid, uh, me and my feelings. I'm raising, like I said, um, uh, two boys uh, until they tell me different, and focusing on and starting with feelings is something that I think is just like phenomenal and has, um, I mean, like we, this has just changed a lot of his language um, and my language and our language as, as, as parents. And it says it's a kid's guide to understanding and, exp and expressing themselves um, um, uh, by a clinician who's black, black woman's completely brilliant. And this is just, opened up so many different things. There's lots of questions in there and questionnaires for students and, and young people to go through. And um, we go slow. We may read one, like we, we had read one page last night and discussed it and had a conversation before we lay down. And uh, it was a great conversation. He had a lot to talk about around it. And I don't go so far to where it's overbearing. It's just like we go enough to explore it. We talk about what the feelings mean, what feelings are, and he's getting to a place where he can uh, explore some of that. Another one, I, you know, because I mentioned earlier about normalizing conversations, but doing it in a way to where um, uh, students are, it's the conversation about racism always super heavy. It's, mm -hmm. It can't always be heavy. But there's, um, there's a book called Jabari Jumps, Okay. Jabari jumps. I wish I had it with me. It's upstairs. Okay. But um, uh, my son is someone who is shy and um, is just a shy person and may be, may continue to be a shy person. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to help him navigate the world as a person that's shy. And Jabari is a, uh, that's a story of uh, a black dad and son who um, Jabari likes to swim and he has all his friends jumped off of the um, the uh, diving board and Jabari was like, ooh, that doesn't look safe to me, man. You guys go ahead. I'm going to wait. Uh, and it just helps process that and help process like there are different ways of being brave. There are different ways of like, you know, exploring the world. Um, another one, Dad by My Side is another book that I would suggest um, that just is show some different ways that um, men interact with their children in non-traditional ways. Mm -hmm. They don't always have to be the protector, the big tough guy. It could be really soft and gentle. Um, Julia Cook is a writer that I would suggest for uh, young young folks. That uh, something that's popular on Facebook right now, and I've. Um, We've got a number of these books, the, a kid's book about series, a kid's book about racism, a kid's book about anxiety, a kid's book about gratitude. They have some good books in that series. And, uh, um, I would suggest those. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I mean, there's so many. The Undefeated is a book, a kid's book. That's an amazing one that I would suggest. As far as adults, um, yeah. I would say, I can't say enough about this book and Dr. J. Croy's book, uh, Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome. Um, I, I'm going back through this slowly this time. Um, and uh, I just can, I continue to pick up amazing tidbits about myself. And then um, uh, being able to better understand like behavior, human behavior, and why people are doing what they're doing. Uh, something that I try to live by is unconditional positive regard. And um, and all, like one of the things I've noticed is when we get up close to someone suffering, Brian Stevenson articulates this really, really well. But when we get up to other people's suffering, it helps us to have more empathy rather than just being responsive and just uh, uh, wanting to just punish people. 
But the post-traumatic slave syndrome helps me understand a little bit of why we see some of the behavior we see in society. And then I can have empathy and better articulate empathy and have empathy for folks as so I respond in a different way um, than I would. Another book that I'm, I'm trying to read is, um, is uh, A Black Woman's History of the United States. I recently got this and I'm working my way through it. It's, um, it's again, for me, trying to just get multiple perspectives and see things differently. Experience it from a black woman's perspective, uh, which is one of the least articulated perspectives in our society. And if we want to actually understand, we need to highlight all the voices that don't get to sit at the table. Mm -hmm. um, if we don't do that, we're going to continue to have margin, margin marginalization. Mm -hmm. And um, but it all, and all of that leads into why we have, why is there social justice education? Well, what's the need for social justice education? Because we don't have um, enough people, the right people, all the people, uh, voices at the table. So we have people who are marginalized. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and we don't tell the truth about um, a lot of things. Uh, can I go on a tangent real quick? I got yeah. a quick tangent I want to talk on, on, on my mind. Another thing that I, I'm hearing too often right now, folks are, there are some folks who are, I'm a Christian, and there are some folks in the Christian community that I have, have some critique for. And one of the critiques I have is folks are frustrated about monuments being taken down. Mm -hmm. And they are frustrated about this, this idea of a race in history. And, um, and I, I've heard a few people even say like, well, they have monuments up in Germany. They wouldn't, they haven't taken those down. But, but I did a little bit of research uh, and, um, and the monuments in Germany are way different than the monuments that we have here. Um, as a person of color, as someone who's had people in my family, direct family, media family lynched, um, it's super traumatizing to walk past um, monuments that highlight people who lynched folks and who had slaves, but don't articulate the truth about that story. Yeah. And so, and you know, you've mentioned the Brian Stevenson um, podcast and, and he mentions in there, cause he's from Alabama. He's like, he went past a monument that was there that was still up, unfortunately, that said like, well, from 1820 to 1860 is the period of antebellum um, uh, prosperity is the way they voiced it. And so it was a, supposedly a great time to be in business. Mm -hmm. And, um, but they don't, they just say that, but don't highlight the fact that there were slaves going on and slaves were all at the, you know, the, 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 the brunt of this supposed business boom. Mm -hmm. And to not tell the whole story is why we have to have social justice education. It's frustrating for uh, folks to, it, the same folks to say um, that the people who are working for free are lazy. That's just one, I've never been able to really understand the like thought process in that. Like, so, okay, wait, so you're, you're owning slaves and you're getting free labor, but you're gonna call the people who are working for free lazy. But the, the hypocrisy in that, the irony, mm -hmm. <laughs> It yes. is uh, is mind blowing. So we just need to highlight those voices. Yes. On a on a on a lighter note, I'll go mm -hmm. on a lighter note. <laughs> I love it all. All of this. Okay. All right. Because I'm a, we're human beings. We're complex. Oh, come on, guys. Yeah. We're <laughs> we're complex human beings, right? So we got all all the stuff is there. Yeah. Um So created for a connection. There's two versions of this. This is a uh, more of a Christian couple version, but Hold Me Tight is another version. I'm reading this with my wife. We're working on our relationship, always trying to get better. Mm -hmm. But um, I would for sure recommend um, Hold Me Tight or Created for Connection for any partner uh, partnership um, because it has just changed our relationship and and given us language to just be on the same page and again to to use an unconditional positive regard just to see the best in each other and know that all of our 
misunderstandings or arguments or frustrations at the end of the day go back to i want to be closer to you i want to be connected to you mm -hmm. and so it's really i love you it's, mm -hmm. and now and then turn, it's coming out in this way of like i'm frustrated that you didn't do this or how come you didn't pick that up and like, at the end of the day it's like i just need a hug man i need yeah. to know that you got my back yeah and so uh and that we're in this together and so that that is a a, a way that um I would suggest that for any, any, any couples. It's just I wrote that down, hmm. Matt, because I, I'll For have sure. to say that this, <laughs> that this, this <laughs> stay at home order situation. <laughs> it could, it could get tricky. It could get tricky. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, you you might order two of those to get the audible yeah. version. It's like, okay, we're gonna read this together. Like, hello. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love it. <laughs> well, we're holding all those things at once, right? I mean, it's yeah, it's, but it's yeah. but like the core of all of it is like love and liberation and mm -hmm. truth. So mm -hmm. I I just think that that alignment is so beautiful, and I hope that we can talk again like this. And once you. Yeah. You know, maybe in a couple months and see like how our kiddos are doing with uh with homeschool and yeah well, about that. Yeah. that interesting too. And I think you're natural for this kind of format. I know at the beginning you're like, I don't know about this, but clearly you're <laughs> gonna have your own show. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Okay, I don't know. It's interesting, but uh, it's it's fun. I love to share, and uh, you know, I've, I've been in a situation to go through a lot and um i love people and yeah. so I, I do love people and so i want to bash for so, yeah. So, yeah <laughs> thank yeah. you for being here i'm so so happy to have had you and um yeah. i just hope we keep in touch i'm gonna i wrote down all the books i'm gonna oh, write cool. write them down in a i'll also share them out to everyone i'm gonna share the podcast Oh yes, that podcast. I've listened to it three times. Really good. Just the, his his articulation of reparations mm -hmm. was like for me. I was like, oh, and, and so the art reparations and his articulation of how um, we can with teeth in it, with some teeth, actually have a conversation about truth and reconciliation throughout the country. Mm -hmm. That's pretty mind blowing. That I had not heard of anyone articulate it like that before, and it's doable. Yeah, that was really powerful. There are models, and yeah. I love yeah. that idea. Though, like, we can't repair unless we have truth. Yeah, right, right. Falsehood. It's fake. It's fake. Then it's, that's what's yeah. being fake, and that's why people are frustrated because they're like, you know, you did this and it happened, and then we just well, like move past it like it didn't happen. Yes, it did happen, and now we're still experiencing those things. So we we got to deal with it. Yeah, for sure. In this together, like you always say. Um, and Jen Rivers, are you still around? <laughs> she usually does the outro. So. I am. I am hey. around. Thank you guys are having such a great conversation. I didn't want to interrupt. I know. I we could go on track. We're gonna do this again. I know. I know. We need to do this again. Jody, I said, hope that Matt. I get to watch. <laughs> Jody, like, Matt, you have to have a podcast. And you're on here I next. Like it. I like it, Jody. <laughs> Thank Thanks you. Us, Jen. <laughs> All right. Thank you both for joining us. That was a fantastic conversation. Um, again, just a reminder, stuff we have coming up. Our trunk show on the 22nd with, um, sorry, the Dye Project. Mm -hmm. And the conversation with local food justice activists on the 23rd. Then on the 27th, our reading with Christopher Beha and Rob Nair. Um, yeah, we yeah. look forward to seeing you then, and we look forward to seeing you as a board week. Yes, we will be here next week talking about how to use our reading as resistance resources, especially talking to teachers and parents. We're going to have a bunch of our new resources up, and we're going to kind of show how to use them. So come back and join us, everybody. Yes. Sounds yes. great. Thank <laughs> you. I'll, I'll be present. Good. <laughs> I'm into that. I'm into that. I love what you're doing there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right. Bye. Thanks, Take care, everybody. everybody. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs>